Hello everybody and welcome to the Vancouver so Island Regional end, so Library can, in partnership with Nanaimo Science in celebrating World Oceans Day. We have Elaine, Jamie and Maddie from Nanaimo Science showing Indira and Corinne from Vural the exciting life forms found in a tide pool. Okay, let's try again because like we need to all walk at the same time. Otherwise, they're just going to go in between us. Okay, there's tons here, yeah. Yeah. So, I'm gonna say still if you wanna. <laughs> Maddie, if you wanna walk out this way a bit. Because right now they're headed that way. At least the ones that. We should have kept the one that we had before, but I didn't want it to get too stressed out, so I released it. Okay. We can try again in a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So, hi, my name is Elaine Parker. I'm the executive director for Nanaimo Science. We're a nonprofit here in town in Nanaimo uh, that does science education with young kids. And today we're going to tell you a little bit about what you can find at Departure Bay Beach during low tide. So the reason we've got this one just kind of all surrounded by rocks is because we went to the tide pool over there and flipped over some stones and found lots of crabs. Um, but this lovely one is a female and she's brooding. So we put her on her own so she wasn't too stressed out and gave her lots of rocks to like feel comfortable under. But generally I would suggest if you find one that's brooding, don't pick them up, just leave them alone. Um, I'm gonna break my own rule here, but we don't really wanna stress her out too much. So the way you can tell is on underneath where their abdomen is, you can see it's popped out and she's got lots and lots of eggs right there. She's very grouchy at me yeah. because she's protecting her eggs. <laughs> so we kept her separate and then after you guys get a chance to look at her, we'll return her right away. Um, so I would, if you notice a little like egg pouch when you're flipping over crabs, just leave them where they are because they can be a lot more sensitive. So we'll put her back in that and maybe pass her over to Elaine to return now that you've had do a chance. Do you want to try and do her underneath the microscope so we can see the eggs? Oh sure, yeah, that's a good idea while well, we've got her. So, do you want to put her just in a petri or in the... Um, she kind of should run around a lot more Okay. <laughs> So, turn on our microscope here. We might even actually just be holding her if we want to look at her under the microscope. There we go. Put her in focus. So you can see her eyes up top, and then her abdomen is just kind of distended a little bit, um, and all the legs are underneath it there. That's pretty awesome. So this one right here is a green or yellow shore crab. Are their common names? Um, we have lots and lots of them, as well as the purple shore crabs around on my sheet here the the these two right here so the purple shore crab and yellow shore crab um they're in the same genus they're both um hemigrapsis but one is hemigrapsis organensis and one is hemigrapsis nudis and the colors can kind of be misleading because a lot of times some of the purple ones will look green and some of the green ones will look purple but the best way to tell them apart is um, the Hemigrapsis nudis, they're named that because their legs are naked. They have no hair on their legs. Whereas the Hemigrapsis organensis has little fine hairs. So I've got a couple of them crawling around in this container here if you want to take a look at them. And I'll pull one out to kind of hi highlight what I mean and show you a little hair on their legs. So this one. 
little guy. You can tell it's a male because instead of that big dome that we saw on the female, uh, it looks kind of more like a lighthouse. A nice skinny to a peak. Okay. And then on their legs, when they stick them out, I'll put them under the microscope so you might have a better look, but they have little individual like translucent hairs. And so that's how I can tell it's a yellow or green shark crab. But mm -hmm. let me grab this. I'll put it in a bigger one here. So they're very quick when look at them under the microscope. So I've got to always try to keep up with them. But you might be able to tell on their legs, their little jointed legs, you'll be able to see individual hairs sticking up. Maybe I'll grab hold of him again. But, oh, don't escape. So, oh, <laughs> waving his legs around. <laughs> yeah, so just like you can see them peeking out, the little hairs sticking off the edge of their legs. It's hard to tell because they're very translucent. Um, like, I can almost see it better in the light here on this leg. Let's see if I can get it. It's okay if they <laughs> blow off, they'll blow off. So I can see it shining in the light here. There's three little hairs on this leg right there. So that's how I can tell it's a green or a yellow shark crab because it has hair on its legs. I'll put them back. Uh, some of the other things we've got in here is we have lots and lots of little periwinkles um, and lots of periwinkle imposters that are hermit crabs that are using the, the periwinkle shells. So you can see them crawling up the side of the toad here. These are just little marine snails. Let's see, I'm not even sure. Oh yeah, here we go. Right here on our sheet are these little periwinkles. And you find lots and lots of them at the beaches here. If you pick up a, and pretty much any rock in the tide pool will have like tens of them on it and uh, they're a little less secure than other mollusks you'll find on rocks known as limpets. So I like to say limpets look like they have a pointy hat, um, like a little party hat. And we've got one right here is an empty shell of a limpet. Um, but you can see they come up into a nice little point, so it's pretty distinct compared to other ones. And we do have a few on this rock here. Um, you can find them. So there's that one there at the top and maybe I'll pick up this rock and we'll see some more of them. Yeah. Oh, and <laughs> so there's a limpet right there and it might be the oh yeah it's the only limpet on this rock. Oh but we found another friend and turning it over we found a little flatworm. So right coming up to my thumb right here Maybe let's put it in the sun, see if you can get a little bit of light on it and see it moving towards the limpet. Ooh, okay. So flatworms are super neat because they don't like anything like your typical like earthworms or other like narrowed worms that you'd find crawling in the dirt. Uh, every time I've found them, the best place for me to look for them at Departure Bay Beach is on the rocks that you pick up. And as you're flipping and looking them around, they kind of look like a blob, a squishy blob, and then they'll start moving on you and that's how you can confirm that it is definitely a flatworm. You can see a picture of one right here. They have their two little eye slots at the front and a little nervous system there as well. So I'm gonna try to get it onto um, a Petri dish because then you'll be able to better see, not blurrier, there we go. So you can see they kind of stretch out nice and long and sometimes um, their head will form almost a little bit of a arrow shape too depending on where they are and what they're crawling over. It's a lot bigger than I thought. Right? <laughs> 
they can really change their shape and they can climb up here i'll turn it this way there it's climbing up on the sides too so you can see it moving around during low tide? I actually don't know too much oh. about flatworms themselves. I normally find them in uh, tide pools. I Because they are super mobile, um, intertidal creatures kind of fall into two different categories two like big categories there's the sessile creatures that can't move and mobile creatures that can generally mobile creatures at low tide will find their way to um to a moister area so more water uh, so if it was kind of stranded up on a rock over here it would either kind of go to the underside where it was protected from the sun or if it if it was like at the edge of the tide here and could notice the tide going out probably follow <laughs> follow the tide a bit um because unlike things like bivalves uh that can close their shells to stay moist or bury themselves further down in the sand um flatworms have a pretty squishy body so i actually would have to do some more research to figure out what specifically their tactics are uh, but they are in the group and the phylum platyhelminthes are these guys so they're and a totally different phylum than your segmented worms like earthworms or nared worms that you'd or other predatory worms that you'd find at the beach which is kind of cool but if i fall show you the bottom of this one what you can see is these guys actually have um ganglia so individual like a nerve cord with individual nerves on the bottom and you can kind of see from underneath the the stem of it which is super neat <laughs> oh, sorry, they're taking it away too fast. No, 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 they're gonna hold on there for longer. Hard to see, but yeah. <laughs> what you'll find with a lot of creatures at the beach, it can be really tricky to identify them to species. Some, like the purple or yellow green shore crab, there's tricks to do that, but a lot of them you're just gonna know them to their bigger group. Um, and sheets like this can be helpful to find their bigger group. And if you take, bring a camera with you and take really uh, close up pictures, then you can use sites like iNaturalist or get out bigger field guides to follow out keys to identify the particular species. But identifying certain features that put them in individual categories is kind of your best bet, uh, a good starting point to identifying what you found out at the beach. I think the other stuff we've got in here is I'm curious about oh some of the barnacles not everyone's favorite a lot of people think they're kind of boring we see them all, a lot they kind of hurt our feet if we're crawling over them barefoot um but they are a really cool arthropod so they're in the same phylum as uh crabs and uh insects arthropods are kind of known for their having their skeleton on the outside we call it an exoskeleton and actually the part of the barnacle we see is not truly their exoskeleton um on the outside but their bodies and their uh feet will kind of they settle on their heads and then their feet will kind of come out of the opening of the barnacle and they'll flip their feet that way so the barnacles on this rock are doing it right now i'm not sure how well you can zoom in but if you watch them you'll see little feet kind of scoop out and try to like grab some food and close it up I'll bring that rock under switch it out with our flatworm friend and see if we can get the barnacle feet barnacles feeding under the microscope to give you a close-up of what i mean we can also do we can yeah. also take the microscope out and put it yeah you know what well i it's a bit deep in the water <laughs> i don't want to risk okay. how big i'm doing it but can i get a I need enough water that the barnacles are still submerged to get them to actually stick their feet out and feed. Oh, and while I'm doing this, if you want to come over, there's a little anemone on this rock, but if I move it, <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to hide from me. So right here, oh, a little okay, anemone, I see a sea anemone. Cool. So those guys, if they're on rocks that aren't, um, that are exposed to like the sun and aren't in a tide pool. Uh, to try to conserve water, what the anemones will do is they'll shrink their stock as like low as possible. Uh, so that the, the smallest amount of them 
is exposed to the sunlight and to predators and to drying out so they can kind of keep all their water close but you do tend to find them um a lot more in tide pools they do they can dry out pretty quickly but we see them in all different types of intertidal areas and like all intertidal creatures they have adapted to, to deal with a little bit of uh sun and water loss and to try to mm, bide their time from low to high tide so generally if you see them they'll try to close up and get as small as possible to retain as much moisture um, as they can to avoid desiccation. desiccation all right let's see if we're going to be lucky with this barnacle together of all the different live life forms do you <laughs> oh there's, there's like here. <laughs> thousands <laughs> hundreds of thousands uh like i said i normally get them to like the group and then for individual species you can take a closer look but yeah there are tons and tons and tons like we're only looking at two different individual species of um crabs that we found but then there's so many others that we found their molts, so that's when arthropods need to grow. They'll shed their exoskeleton uh, and grow a little bigger, and we call those exoskeletons the molts. Um, and we've seen lots of molts of different species of crabs, so we know there's other crabs in and around, but they might be hanging out a little bit more in the subtidal area. Mm -hmm. um, and because, like I said, they're mobile instead of sessile, so as the tide goes out, they can kind of run along with it. Uh, so we wouldn't necessarily see them if we were hanging out right where the tide meets the shore. Um, but all of a sudden, if you were to put on a mask and fins and go for a snorkel, you might see a bunch more species that we do have here that they just uh, like to hang out inside the water and not expose themselves to the rest of um, the beach when the tide's out. So, uh, try not to get in your way, but... Maybe we'll leave the barnacle for a little bit, but once it feels comfortable, <laughs> I haven't moved it as much. So in here, we've got, yeah, like I think you saw the anemone. So when I pull it out of the water, you'll see what it starts to do. So this was the anemone you looked at earlier, and all its tentacles have now come in. It's drooped low, so it would stay nice and like as small as possible until the tide came in. And like you saw, when it was in the water, it was able to reach out its tentacles. It felt super comfortable. So we'll put it back in, kind of near the edge, maybe. That's to really a spot a that tiny, we can see. Tiny <laughs> yeah, so anemones um, don't typically, you don't tend to find a lot of them at this style of beach because as you can see, like it was on a really small uh, shell and small rocks. And so those small rocks get like knocked around by the tide a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's really hard for creatures that are living on the rocks. Uh, it's a lot harder for them to survive there than if they were in maybe a more wavy exposed area. So instead of a sandy beach and it was a lot of bedrock, that bedrock's not going to move around on them. So they might get hit by a lot of waves, but the substrate they're attached to isn't going to move. Whereas if they're on some, the larva will settle and start to grow on rocks like these, but they just won't serve their chance of survival is a lot lower on a beach like this where the substrate they're on is getting knocked around as the tide goes in and out. So that's why we also don't tend to see a lot of sea stars here. Um, you can find some, but it's just not as nice as an environment for them as maybe a more exposed beach that has lots of bedrock that they can uh, mm -hmm. climb onto and move around. I've often wondered why they, I don't see sea stars around here. <laughs> yeah, so it's just, it's the style of beach. Yeah. So sandy beaches are, are sand, like they can move around on them too, but as the tide goes out, there's less crevices for them to hide uh, under to keep themselves safe from the heat of the sun. And a lot of the stuff, they're their preferred prey. Um, there's it's harder for their preferred prey to attach to so sea stars really like to eat a lot of mussels and stuff like that and while we do find some mussels here you're not you don't find a lot of mussel beds uh on a sandy beach as you would a more rocky exposed one that has a lot of bedrock so in here beyond our little animals we've also got some different types of seaweed so this is some fucus so it's actually one of the books you guys were showing us so I'll kind of, here, I'll 
put it out in the light for you there. So Fugus are, is it's Latin genus and we like to call it rockweed is the common name for it. It's tricky with the common names because for example with the I, what I call a green shore crab, our ID sheet said was a yellow shore crab. So that's why a lot of the things we know uh, and see on the beach can be the same thing. We just have different names for it. And that's why on ID, on ID sheets, you'll always find a Latin name underneath it too, because that's something that's consistent among the different common names. So let's see on my sheet here. Ooh, this is an animal one. Never mind. Let's open your book. To where I saw some fugus. So in the seaweed book from the library, if we open it up to page 27, we've got a picture of it right here, the little fucus or rockweed as it's commonly known. And we can hold it right up to next. So you see it branches off in different sections. Sometimes these sacks are filled with air. Our kids lot like to really go around the beach and pop them. <laughs> but yeah, they, what's cool about seaweed is unlike uh, land plants that have a root system, they have what we call a hold fast. So that's just at the end of their stalk and that's what we'll attach uh, onto some hard substrate or into the sand at the bottom of um, the seafloor. And then it's handy to have some air sacs at, uh, in your kind of branches because that will help them like be brought up to the top to get the sunlight that they need. Um, what you might find at the beach too, which is kind of cool, is sometimes you'll find this like white uh, stuff floating in the water and everyone's always like really concerned about like, oh, what's this weird white stuff? It's just uh, seaweed that has been bleached by the sun. So we have two different um, other kinds of algae that you'll see lots of. So this is this green algae here is Alva. Um, and then we have some red algae on this one whose species I am actually not too sure of. Um, but when a lot of the time the red algae and the alva are pretty susceptible to being um, bleached by the sun and so when they've lost their color the easiest way to tell like what kind of seaweed they were is to look at the other features of it. So this seaweed here is really smooth um, and kind of lettuce like and that's what lettuce that's what alva is actually known as its common name is sea lettuce. <laughs> So I'm pretty confident in saying that's some alva that had been bleached. Whereas if you look at some of my, the red algae I have here is a little tougher and kind of branches off in sections. <laughs> Do we have our seaweed sheets? Let me pull those up because sometimes I have seen some bleached red algae that are different. Here we go, seaweed. Do you have any Turkish towel in there too? That's what I'm thinking of, yeah, the okay. Turkish towel. Because that's what we saw a lot of at Neck Point. The, a lot of the bleached. Mm -hmm. My was Turkish towel. So, this is one really common species of red algae, commonly known as Turkish towel. And we have seen a lot of bleached Turkish towel. The main difference is that it's really bumpy or on the edges of it. And so that's another reason why I'm pretty confident that this one here is Alva because it's nice and smooth despite being bleached. So if it's white seaweed, it's lost its color, it makes identification a little bit harder, but you can still identify it by the different features of it, like uh, its texture. Interesting. As much. So in here, we've got yeah, like I think you saw the anemone. So when I pull it out of the water, you'll see what it starts to do. So this was the anemone you looked at earlier and all its tentacles have now come in. It's drooped low, so it would stay nice and like as small as possible until the tide came in. And like you saw when it was in the water, it was able to reach out its tentacles and felt super comfortable. So we'll put it back in kind of near the edge maybe to a spot that we can see. <laughs> yeah, so anemones um, don't typically, you don't tend to find a lot of them at this style of beach because as you can see, like it was on a really small 
uh, shell and small rocks and so those small rocks get like knocked around by the tide a lot uh, and so it's really hard for creatures that are living on the rocks uh, it's a lot harder for them to survive there than if they were in maybe a more wavy exposed area so instead of a sandy beach it was a lot of bedrock that bedrock's not going to move around on them so they might get hit by a lot of waves but the substrate they're attached to isn't going to move Whereas if they're on some, the larva will settle and start to grow on rocks like these, but they just won't serve, their chance of survival is a lot low. <laughs> All right, so another thing you can find at the beach that we are specifically looking for in our citizen science program that we do with the grade fives at in SD68 is we are searching for varnish clamps with them. So these ones you kind of have to dig down into the sand to find. Oh, overflowing. Oh, protect the books. Perfect. So these are some invasive species that are originally from uh, Southeast Asia, so in Japan, Korea. And they came over in the ballast of boats as larvae. Um, back in the 90s and when they emptied out the water and the when they got to port um the larva came up to shore and settled and they have been here for quite some time now so these guys were, were probably born on this beach um the way we identify uh clams is, or we call them bivalves because they have two shells or two mm -hmm. valves attached at a hinge so the hinge of varnish clams are super prominent like it's very obviously sticking out there for everyone to see and varnish clams in particular um can, can have a nice like brown shiny surface but uh as they age they can also lose that and turn like a little bit more white and purpley so there's some dead shells over here of the same species so you might find adult ones that are alive um that are the same species but it's mostly this like white purplish that you see and the brown is just a little bit around the edges uh, another feature of them to help you identify them is they only have ridges in the horizontal direction uh, whereas a lot of other clam and bivalve species will have ridges in both or just in the vertical direction so that's a really key feature you can look at when you're looking at for bivalves uh, to help you identify them. There should be a little mineral in there, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Lee. It's going. <laughs> so, for example, <laughs> this is a little manila clam, also an invasive species. Um, and as you can see, it's got ridges both horizontally and vertically along it that way and its hinge that connects them is a lot less that connects its valves is a lot less prominent than the hinge of the varnish clam which sticks out the hinge of the manila clam right here um, is a lot more flush with the two valves so these kind of species mm -hmm. could still be coming over on ships all the time right like yeah so a lot of invasive species hitch a ride with humans yeah. <laughs> so we are kind of guilty for transporting a lot of invasive species as in their larval forms in water uh, a lot of in invasive species get to new places um, when people release their pets they're thinking oh i can't take care of it anymore uh, like with all good intentions want it to be free in a natural environment uh, but if it's a species that's not originally from here um, and if there's other people who have done the same thing, then a population can really start to grow and take over. Uh, so yeah, a lot of times on boats, if someone's um, left their boat tied up uh, at one lake for a long time and things start to settle on the bottom of boats, then you know, pick it up, put it in a trailer, drive to a different boat um, for the next season. Things can transfer that way too. A lot of seed dispersals get travel a lot by cars. So seeds will get like stuck in mud and as car tires go over them, get stuck in the treads of your car and you're off on a road trip and can bring things other, uh, other places. So yes, unfortunately, <laughs> we kind of help with the transfer of invasive species quite a bit. Uh, but 
you can only do the best for you, right? So if you're aware, when you're aware of something, you can try to make changes to impact that. But um, yeah, you can. So people in Nanaimo can take part by, if they're kayaking or using a canoe or a small um, speedboat, they can make sure to wash off of their canoes and kayaks or their water vessels before moving to another location. And that will help avoid some of that cross-contamination between different sites. Good job, Jean, you found the sculpin. <laughs> that was all ready. Okay, so we won't stress this it, it, one it's not, it does not do well underneath the microscope because it's so yeah, large. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've got a little sculpin here. And the two types of sculpin you'll mostly find uh, at Departure Bay are either staghorn sculpin or tide pool sculpin. So we have them right here on our ID sheet. Um, the bigger picture of the Pacific staghorn and the little tide pool sculpin here. A big feature of sculpins is they have a nice wide, wide head and they kind of taper off towards their tails. So if you look at it, it's got a really large head and tapers off, its body shape tapers off towards its tail. You can kind of see on its pectoral fins, the two fins on the side, it's got nice bands of rays along them. Um, for the stag horn sculpin, the best the sculpins all, again, like I said, are pretty, like most tide pool creatures, are hard to distinguish from one another. But the gill covering, the operculum of stag cord sculpins has a little bit, it kind of like looks like a branching antlers. And that's how they kind of got their common name from. So if you look on the sheet here, right by my finger, is their gill covering with, it's a bit easier with fish that are larger. I feel more comfortable picking it up and kind of opening it up, but so we've got a little moon jelly here that you can see it. Typically, if you're finding a jellyfish in a tide pool or washed up on the beach, uh, it will be dead. Um, they do not <laughs> survive very well outside of the water and uh, if they're getting knocked around a bunch. Uh, it is perfect safe to pick up the moon jellies. They do, everyone always is wondering, oh, will they sting me? Technically, yes, but you won't be able to feel it because it's not uh, strong enough to hurt you. So their stinging cells or ninocytes will go off, but um, these moon jellies in particular, are they're not strong enough to, to hurt you. So even though they are stinging you, you won't feel it. <laughs> and then you said you got a larger crab somewhere for us to look at? Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay, so this is an example of a bigger male crab. Um, it is a dead one, it is not a molt. And we can tell that because you can still, a good thing to look for is if it still has its eyes or if you open it up and you can just see all of its body parts. So when we looked at the brooding uh, green shore crab, we opened up its abdomen and all of her eggs were underneath there. For this is a male, you can see just like the males we looked at, it kind of looks more like a lighthouse. If it was a female, it would be a bit more like a dome or a beehive is another term that people try to look for. So, Are there oh, any specific <laughs> times of the year that they breed or do they breed year round? I'm not sure about species specific. I'm pretty sure the spring is generally when I is when I've seen it in the past, but I'm not sure of any particular months for those specific ones. A lot of the times if you have questions um, like that a lot, it's a great idea to buy a kind of like tide pool exploration guide or Welks to Wales is a really good book to get from the library. I know it has tons of copies um, because at each beyond like our sheets are really great for identifying like the group and for in some cases individuals but they don't have a lot of information about them and the information that they do have about them is just descriptors but bigger books like rocks to wills or other like tide pool exploration books will give you some of the like behavior descriptions um reproduction descriptions and anatomy other anatomy features of 
tide pool creatures. <laughs> so this one here, the like back part of the crab, we call its carapace. Um, one of the really distinguishable features for this one is the little ridges are scalloping along the edges. So this one here is a red rock crab. You can kind of see in the picture, it's also got those big scallops along it. And then the part everybody is always very excited about are their chilbits, are their claws. What I would say is even young red rock crabs can pack a bit of a punch with their claws. So uh, if you see some of these at the beach, it's really cool, really exciting. The young ones will have tons of cool patterns um, when they're juveniles. And then as they get bigger, it just turns red. So they're really neat to see, but I would recommend having an adult uh, pick them up if someone's going to pick them up or to wear gloves. Um, me and myself, I just let them be. They are super cool to see, but uh, their, their claws are very forceful. Uh, especially in, cons in comparison to the small uh, shore crabs. They'll try to pinch you too, but they're so much smaller that as long as you're gentle with them, um, it won't be able to harm you. So if you're hoping to search the Perchery Beach for, for crabs to pick up, the pur purple and green or yellow shore crabs are the most kid-friendly. <laughs> but you should probably not be handling any of the creatures, right, that you see because it would stress them out? Or? Yes, yes and no. I mean, it definitely will stress out any animals that you're you're trying to handle at the beach because their kind of instinct is you're some something that's coming to eat them mm -hmm. uh but for the crabs as long as you're gentle with them for example if i was like to pick one up from here i like to kind of come in from behind and scoop them up And then when I hold them, I like to hold them just from the back, from their little legs there. Um, so they're pretty hardy and resilient. It definitely isn't a great idea to have them out for too long um, because it, it every interaction with you will, will stress them out a bunch. So we'll definitely be releasing everything we've got in this little tank as soon as our videos are done. Uh, but they are pretty hardy and they're used to predators coming at them too. So as long as you're being mindful of the fact that even things like clams, even though they don't have a visible head and don't look as kind of fun and moving around as crabs, they are still animals and we want to be gentle with them when we're holding them and put them back in the same area we got them from. So for the clams, we dug them out of the sand when it's <laughs> when we're done cool looking at them and IDing them, we'll rebury them back in the sand so not, they're not easy pickings for the birds or anything. Uh, especially with clams, if you're digging for them, they have a lot easier time digging down than digging up. So it's important not to rebury them back too deep. <laughs> well, I'd like to just say thank you so much for all your information and I'm sure mm -hmm. um, all our customers at the Vancouver Island Regional Library would really appreciate everything you taught us. And mm -hmm. we are going to have a scavenger hunt as well. Awesome. And, um, awesome. Yeah, so uh, I'm, uh, everybody can watch out for that on our website. We will have information. And I, you did say you will provide some of the some I prizes. I do. We do have some yeah. prizes. We yeah. have some okay. excellent resource books uh, similar to what we have here, but aimed towards younger children, as well as one for adults with lots of pages and lots of color pictures. Uh, and one other thing, if I could plug, is that um, we will be doing science interpretation of this nature throughout the summer. It's something that we've done across Nanaimo uh, for many years now. So if you look for Nanaimo Sciences website, we'll be doing things at the Percher Bay Beach in the south, north, and central areas of Nanaimo. And uh, we hope you get to join us. Completely free, drop in uh, during the day. Very fr family friendly too. Yeah, we will be here at Departure Bay the first week of July from 10 to noon on the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of that week. Um, and we'll have, we'll put together a little touch tank like this and we'll have little buckets and nets for kids and families to explore the intertidal and see what they can find and identify. So yeah, so with the funding that we got from BC Hydro, 
All our tables are so handy. <laughs> they go through it. They they they've seen some crazy stuff. So we're just gonna move these guys out of the sun also. Which is not very good for them. So oh, no, there we go. I mean they're used to it. The tide pulls heat up too. <laughs> yeah, so we got some different books. Wow. And some wow. These are similar to what we have, but we can throw in a couple of what we have as well. And these explain a little bit more about, um, have a little bit more detail and talk about the tides here. And they are double sided, so they have different specimens on both sides. And we will also throw in some dip nets and uh, other things that will help you with your scavenging on the beach. And uh, yeah, I hope that you get to explore with your families. Okay, sure. Can we buy these? Um, yep, we got these at okay. um, that uh, the Children's Treehouse. Oh, they're, okay. they're located right across from us. But we wanted to make sure that um, some families could like take them. These are yeah. nice because they're laminated like our sheets. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, these ones here were originally sourced from the Royal yeah. BC Museum. So you can get them. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is like I thought a really younger version, um, like mm. middle middle sort of ages. This is a, more of a storybook, and yeah, this is this is a grown up version. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of information. So these type of books where it's nice to be able to like if you know the like bigger group, whatever you found belonged into, um, then you can pull out one of these guys to like identify specific like species.